is the end session for uh, uh, foot and ankle course. And today um, um, I'm happy to introduce and present my, uh, my dear friends, uh, Professor Joel Verme. Uh, he is uh, one of the most famous in uh, Mini Invasive, but it's a, uh, also as the founder of Mini Invasive, uh, Mini Invasive uh, Societies and all over the world. And also he, ha he has many techniques about, uh, uh, about many invasive. So I'm- um, much. So. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's a great honor to be there with you. And uh, I will, I'm going to present you uh, Peccato's uh, approach in for foot surgery. Why? Oh, it's not. Uh, sorry. Excuse me, two seconds. Okay. Why percutaneous surgery? Why mini invasive surgery? For a few reasons. First, some specific to the surgeon because we become more and more specialized in foot and ankle, and the evolution and specialization of the technology, like the mini drill, the little saw blade, and some are relating to the patient, so as a cosmetic point of view or stiffness. But to understand everything, we need to do some history. Everything starts in America with Morton Pollock and Pollockoff in 1945. This approach is developed by the podiatrist. They ran the first percutaneous course in 1974, but unfortunately, complication happened with the popularization of the techniques through the United States of America. This has caused it to be named in the 80s at the surgical foot cripple by Johnson. Then, if some podiatrists went away to percutaneous approach, such as uh, Scott Wade, who developed the scarf osteotomy, other, like Stephan Isham, persevere in the method. Stephan Isham is a podiatrist involved in the development and promotion of percutaneous technique in America. He developed the Riverdan Isham procedure. It is an intracapsular osteotomy, a distal medial closing wedge osteotomy that will correct the DMA. Now we have to come back in Europe. In the 90s, there is two surgeons, Louis Samuel Baruch and Mariano de Prado, one in France, one in Spain, they are both looking for new technique in the early 90s. One is speaking English, that's Samuel Baruch. One is speaking Spanish, Mariano de Prado. Both heard about podiatric surgeon in, the, uh, in America, and they both went to America. Went, one went to see whale and bring back the scarf, it's Samuel Baruch. The other one went to meet Stefan Isham, who is working in uh, Mexico, and bring back the Isham Roverna osteotomy and the DMMO in the early 90s. Mariano de Prado is an orthopedic surgeon, and he started to train and to teach mini invasive surgery since the 90, since 93, teaching the Isham Roverna and the distal metatarsal metaphysal or mini invasive osteotomy but he started to teach it in all the world of the Spanish world. In 2000, we have a background in France of eight years of the scarf on the whale osteotomy with some disappointment, stiffness, we want a cosmetic scar. And then we heard about Mariano uh, talking about uh, percutaneous technique in Spain, unlucky, Mariano is speaking French. Then a group has been created 
is the Great MIP. The Great MIP is a group, international group of orthopedic surgeons focused on foot and ankle. We are doing research on training and teaching in mini invasive surgery. Then we start to do the DMMO because the whale was disappointed, very stiff, floppy toes. With the DMMO, no more stiffness, and we were very happy. Then we start to do some Isham Reverda, but not completely happy with the Isham Reverda. And coming from the classic scaphosotomy, we develop more and more procedure. And it's really an evolution from an uh, old technique from the 80s to classic surgery. From the no fixation on dedicated osteotomy to a classic fixation on classic osteotomy. But how to do it? To do percutus technique, you need specific tools. We need burrs and a specific drill burr machine with a high torque. We need a pencil driver. And the burr is used as the tip of your finger. You can feel the cortex, you can feel the spoon. Unique specific burr of different size, different length on different shapes, one to cut, one to shave. Some specific instruments, such as the beaver blade or mini invasive instruments, such as a mini invasive periosteal elevator, some rasp. Last, you need a mini serum. But what to do with all of this? What can we do? What can we correct? If we look at the forefoot, we can do a lot of different procedures. First, we can focus on the allux valgus deformity. And let's talk first about the Isham Roverda osteotomy. What's the Isham Roverda osteotomy? The Isham Roverda osteotomy is a distal medial closing wedge osteotomy of the first metatarsal. This osteotomy requires three steps. First, a large bunionectomy. Second, an capsular osteotomy. And last, a lateral release. This is a remarkably interesting procedure offering a dynamic correction by applying valgus forces on the metatarsal and various forces on the phalanx. You correct with the medial wedge the DMA and you exaggerate it in the other way. Then all the tendon will be pulling the metatarsal laterally, closing the angle M1, M2. Publication shows good results for mild and moderate deformity with 87 to 90% of good and very good outcome. But we had few issues. First, the lack of fixation for the first ray was prohibitive for some surgeon. The use of a rigid dressing and a large exostosectomy has been responsible of stiffness, 7%, like the Seri or kramer bosch manion techniques. But last, the learning curve was too long and too difficult. And I stopped, to teach it. I stopped teaching it uh, to my registrar as it was too difficult for me to control what they were doing. It was near impossible to control the cut of a trainee surgeon. That's why we move to a chevron osteotomy. 
The Schumer osteotomy is a very interesting osteotomy. The main advantage of it's the possibility to manage the length of the first metatarsal by the direction of the burr. Then, if you want, you can shorten the first metatarsal, putting the burr from distal to proximal for the apex of your chevron. Lengthening will be the opposite direction. With the chevron, you have the possibility of plantarization of the head just by the orientation of your burr from dorsal to plantar. Here is an example of chevron osteotomy. I like to test my foot always with my finger to measure the space between the first metatarsal and the second metatarsal. And that will that tell me uh, or the displacement I will be able to do. Just a stab incision. Little plantarization to avoid metatarsalgia. And the burr and the cut are extra articular. We are not in the joint. So less stiffness. Then you can do the dorsal cut with rota simple rotation. When the rotation is done, you stop the burr. You are always in the bone, so you can't damage any tissue to back at the level of your apex, and then you can start to do the plantar cut. Plantar cut done. You can control. It's a little chevron because I don't need the chevron to fix it. To be stable, I will put some screws. So I just need a chevron to dictate the direction of my uh, of the head of the displacement of my head. Then you have to organize the fixation. Why? When the fixation is ready, you can do the translation. Be careful to hold the position of the head in the right place. Then you translate, then simply you can drill on the top of the KY and then you can fix it. I'm coming more and more proximal so I can remove the lateral side, medial side of the bone. And then you fix it. The spike can be removed. The screw, I like to put two screws. Now I'm coming more proximal. Then I have to remove this piece of bone. So you can cut it or you can shave it. You can take it off. You can leave it inside just by pushing it in the middle of the pool. I leave it more and more inside. Then you can do an hacking like you uh, were doing a normal hacking. It's a vertical cut, one dorsal cut, one plantar cut. Again, for the fixation, one KY. The screw. On the lateral release, not systematic, but probably in my hand, 10%.
Here, an example with a small translation, 40% with one dorsal screw. Here, a more severe deformity that requests a large displacement with a complete remodeling at four months. It is very interesting to see this remodeling after months when initially your two screw are not touching any bone during one centimeter. At the end, you have a complete remodeling of the first metatarsal. We had no non-union on the different publication. Some of my colleagues report some delay union, but no non-union. Why we can obtain a such remodeling? Our explanation is the preservation of the soft tissue on the vascular supply of the head. The technique is readable for revision, like this open chevron osteotomy. What's about the learning curve? Should be difficult to learn. No, different publications show very encouraging results. For Ezekiel Palmonovic, it took 20 patients, 26 patients to reduce from two hours to 45 minutes in a surgical time with a patient high level satisfaction. Oh, sorry. Avander Bedi report the result of this first 120 patients with an 87% of satisfaction rate. Why to use Perkinev Chevron? First, we all think about the scar and the aesthetic aspect. It is true and the patient love it. But what I prefer is the mobility. Here, a six weeks post-op. We consider that pre-op and post-op mobility should be the same. Because the chevron is extra-articular on the osteotomies of both first metatarsal and allux proximal phalanx are fixed rather than relying on the dressing on the external KY. That's why probably we don't have this stiffness and because the patient can practice very quickly and move their toes. Yes, we can correct a per, uh, allux valgus deformity with a percutage osteotomy. Yes, if we adapt the procedure. What are your operative goals? Always the same, that to close the angle M1, M2, to reduce the deformity and relocate the sesamoid. All the papers of a percolar chevron report a high level satisfaction rate for the radiological measure, for the alpha score, and for the patient. Few studies compare it to uh, an open procedure with a complete success, but with a better satisfaction rate from the patient. Last point, postoperative pain is significantly less than with an open scarf hacking or a chevron hacking open procedure. With a chevron, patients are back to all their activity at three months for eight, more than 80% of the patient, such as running and jumping. So recovery, yes, is generally quicker because of the stable or strong fixation and because of the lack of stiffness with a return complete function. And of course, the fact that the woman can wear their high heel shoes. But does a chevron can do everything? 
if the correction is impossible with a distal osteotomy, you have to come more proximal. Then you have to think about the percutaneous basal osteotomy or lapidus. Percutaneous basal osteotomy, it's a lateral closing wedge as initially described for open technique. I like to use a Shannon, that's a long cutting burr of 20 millimeter length by two millimeter diameters and a 3.1 millimeter wedge, which is a reaming burr. I used to introduce them dorsally. And then when your ostotomy, you start to do your ostotomy, you can close it and evaluate the ostotomy. At the pictures number one, I'm not happy. Then put back your burr and remove a little bit more. I like this fact that it's like in the restaurant is a menu. You start with something, you are happy, it's done. You are not happy, you do a little bit more until you are completely happy. The fixation is then closed manually and the fixation is realized with one or two screws of three millimeter from medial to lateral insert of a temporary K wire. The position of the screws must be controlled with fluoroscopy. Here, an example, same patient, one screw one side, two screws the other side. Unfortunately, there is a small number of paper on percutaneous basal osteotomy, but they report the same complication than open. The technique is a little bit more demanding than the chevron osteotomy, but offer a very nice narrow foot. The last solution, if you are coming more proximal, is the percutaneous lapidus. Same than open from a medial approach, excision of the joint with the burr, then a rasp to remove all the debris until the X-ray pleases you. I like to fix it classically first with two cross screws and then a third screw like a proper lapidus. And like a lapidus, or actually some paper about the lapiplasty, my, one of my concerns with the lapidus is the shortening of the first ray. Of course, you can avoid the metatarsalgia, transfer metatarsalgia, by plantarization of the head, but there is still this little shortening with the lapidus. Postoperative care is the same for both the lapidus and the basal osteotomy. Heel weight bearing in my hand and uh, orthopedic heel shoes for six weeks. Now we can talk about the lesser toe, the lesser ray. What can we do? What can we do with metatarsalgia and toe deformity? Can we correct it with percutaneous technique? So what to do with metatarsalgia? I would like to start with this example. It's a patient of 39 years old, caught with barefoot, has done the stretching and now he has a negative silver skull. He tries the insoles, but no success. Classically, we will do a whalosotomy of the second third, eventually four. What we can do, it's a DMMO, a distal metatarsal metaphysal osteotomy. And when you do it, that's what you can obtain. An 
So that's the immediate post-op X-ray with my dressing. The shortening is automatic. Nice curve. And then at three months, the nice curve of your forefoot with a complete remodeling of the metatarsal, even with the initial angulation. How to do it? You need a burr, a 12 millimeter burr, Shannon. We don't use 20K compared to the uh, whale of stotomy. And we always encourage to not to use the 20K when you use a burr, but because of the burr, the speed of the burr, you may burn the skin. And particularly with the DMMO, as our approach is dorsal, the skin on the dorsal part of the foot is small, smooth and thin and may be burned very quickly. Same position for all the surgery of our forefoot as we use X-ray. You need the foot outside the table, the patient supine. So what is a DMMO? The DMMO is a mix between one old technique, the basal chevron osteotomy, that's what we were doing before the whale osteotomy in the late 80s, early 90s. It was an open vertical chevron of the lesser ray, non fixed. And we asked the patient to wait there immediately after the surgery a mix of the chevron and the whale osteotomy, a distal osteotomy. Mixed between, because it's dynamic, mixed because it's distal, but there is difference with the whale osteotomy. Dynamic, not dynamic. The DMMO, because it's dynamic, must not be fixed. The displacement of the head will happen when the patient will wait there. On both, there is a shortening. A elevation limited with the DMMO and control with the whale because of your cut. The DMMO are adapt to the patient Adapt to the patient because they will move for this patient as he will start full weight bear. When the weight osteotomy is based on the normality of the curve, two millimeters, two millimeters, two millimeters. One is percutaneous and one is open. It's not an LR osteotomy. We have to be careful. The LL osteotomy, it's a distal osteotomy from proximal to distal, when the DMMO is from distal to proximal. First, just a stab incision, longitudinal transfer. I prefer a longitudinal incision, just at the level of the MTP chain. You don't need to release any soft tissue. We don't want any blood, any hematoma, sorry. We use a 12 millimeter burr that you will introduce by your stab incision and insert through this portal directly extra articular towards the right hand side of the metatarsal head. How to do it exactly? When you introduce your burr against the metatarsal, you rasp along the neck of the metatarsal proximally and distally, so as to ensure the burr is on the bone and to locate it, the distal stop point of the neck where the burr 
about capsule of the MTPG on the distal flare of the metatarsal neck. When you feel the head, you are in the right position. You are extraarticular, so you will have no stiffness. This is the starting point of the osteotomy. Then you must orient the bone as it sits 45 degrees to the dorsal metatarsal axis. You can confirm the position of the burr with a fluoroscope. But with more experience, that's not uh, something we do classically. When the position is correct, then you can rotate and finish. You really have to go slowly. There is no rush. On the burr has engaged the bone, the surgeon supinates the wrist in a smooth action until the burr lies flat on the foot at 90 degrees to the metatarsal axis in the AP plane. It's an extra articular osteotomy. And if you are trained in a carnaval, you can do your dissection. Here's the joint and here your osteotomy, sorry. And just proximal, the osteotomy. So it's really important to be extra articular. There is no debris. So one of the problem of the burr is to create a paste of bone. On this paste of bone, if you leave it in the bone, in the joint, sorry, it's like an inflammatory bump and create a lot of stiffness. That's why it's very important all the time, if you can, to work outside any joint with your burr. On the toes. What about the toes? I would like first to show you this simple case. It's a patient came back for me to me for a revision of this first surgery on the second toe. She has a valgus of a valgus deformity at the, at the level of the first phalanx. She has a DIP fusion, inflection, and valgus. So what to do? To plan it open is difficult. You have to open it again when the scar is all along the toe. With the burr, there is no brain. First, a simple medial closing wedge osteotomy at the level of P1 with an eight millimeter bar. Just there. When the wedge is obtained, you keep the lateral cortex intact. It's like an akin, and then you close it. And you have your correction of the first phalanx. A stable correction because you just you leave the lateral cortex intact. And then for this DIP joint fused in an incorrect way, you can do a dorsal closing wedge osteotomy, close dorsal and medial closing wedge osteotomy. And do it by this way you can obtain a perfect correction of the two. There is many things that we can do with the burr at the level of the toe. We can do a soft tissue correction, we can do bone correction. Let's start with the soft tissue correction. Arthrolysis, tendon lengthening. How to do a tendon lengthening? Where to do it? If you want to lengthen both tendon, flexor brevis and flexor lengthening, uh, longus, you can just approach 
the plantar part of the first phalanx base the f at the base of the first phalanx then you can cut both with your beaver blade but if you prefer to do an elective section you can only cut the flexor brevis at the level of the PIP chain. I remember you that the flexor brevis, if is superficial, proximal, become deeper at the level of the base of P2 where it's insert. So if you follow the bone at the level of the head of P1, you can easily cut the flexor brevis without cutting the flexor longus. And then you still have the grasping effect. Or, like some surgeon who prefer to only cut the flexor longus, and that would be done just before the DIPJ from a plantar approach, if you want, or lateral or medial approach. It's not a problem. Then, if we have cut the flexor, what can we do with the long, the extensor? The extensor tendon can be cut at two levels, at the level of the MTPT, or more proximal, mid shaft of the metatarsal. Going mid shaft of the metatarsal, you can select which one you want to cut. The bone, it's a very interesting procedure. When we correct it at the level of the bone, the first osteotomy we perform, it's at the level of the base of P1. It is a basal plantar closing weight osteotomy of P1. The, the procedure is performed with an eight millimeter burr. And the classic way to do it is from plantar. You push your burr against the sheath of the flexor tendon, then you go laterally or medially against the bone. Again, the phalanxes must be no soft tissue. You can control the position with X-ray to be sure you are not first in the joint or to distal that will uh, that will be responsible of a less of correction. When your burr is at the right position, a simple rotation on the osteotomy is obtained. You take off the burr and then by just pressing on the head of the first phalanx, you obtain a closing weight osteotomy on the correction of your phalanx. Then you can add on every osteotomy you want, like the medial closing weight osteotomy I show you on the example. What is very important to understand that all philosophy, my philosophy, is not to create a technique that fits the technology, but to use the new technology to fit with established technique. I don't like the, the Mitchell osteotomy. It's not a stable osteotomy. I would not do it percutaneously. I prefer to do an osteotomy that works perfectly, but instead to do it open, doing percutaneously. The same when you do a ligament reconstruction of your knee, you do exactly the same than the open procedure, but you do it arthroscopically. Percutaneous technique should be used in the same way. Can we talk about economic 
point of view is difficult. The economic aspect of Perculus technique depends on the system of each country. Because the cost of the bug, because of the time in the hospital, so the procedure can be less expensive for the state or more expensive for the state. For example, in France, because we can do a day, day case surgery or in England, it's a day case surgery. The patient can go back home one hour after the procedure. The cost of the hospital is less in terms of space, there's no need of bed, no need of room, no need of a nurse looking after the patient during one day. But if the economic is not the main thing, what you have to think about is the Perculus technique, it's really another tool in the box. Perculus technique offer you so many possible techniques as the achinostotomy of the first phalanx of a toe. You will not do it open because it will be massively aggressive to open and just for a little osteotomy. Then, because you have more technique, more possibility of technique, you have a better adaptation to the pathology, a better adaptation for the patient, and then a more functional and better result. In conclusion, patellar surgery is my solution for four foot deformity. Patellar technique are reliable technique with great result, but they require a proper training on cadaver. And that was the problem in the 80s when Johnson described the patellar technique like a crippled foot because there were no training not enough. The training must be done on the cadaver, and I recommend the great Mi now MIFAS course to learn. It's very important not to start alone with no training on background, because if you don't do it properly, like everything, you may end up, you may end up with a mess and a catastrophe, and then you will the patient will be unhappy, you will be unhappy, and you will think that it's a problem of the perculous technique. No, it's a problem of training. I would like to thank you again for the invitation, and I would love to meet all of you in uh, Egypt next time. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for this interesting talk. Uh, Professor Henny will uh, start uh, the uh, the, the moderation, Dr. Hani. Any questions, okay, please, Professor Hani? Okay, thank you, Joel, about uh, a very interesting and elegant uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, I think here there is an, we have a question. With perctinous technique, what about uh, colectomy and post operative care? Is the first question. So kelectomy, yes, I always forget about uh, talking about kelectomy. Kelectomy, it's a very elegant way. It's, but it's, it's already done with arthroscopy. It's the same procedure as an arthroscopy. You just put a burr, you can shave the dorsal part of the bone. And between different countries, it's different how much you can remove. But kelectomy, it's great. Uh, opportunity to keep the joint intact, to increase the mobility, and not to fuse the joint. For me, kelectomy is a full weight bear immediately with a flat shoe. They take off the flat shoe two days later and start doing the exercise. So it's a very, very interesting procedure. And 
a few of my friends like Olivier Lafnetre, David Redfern, we are doing, personally, I'm doing only one or two fusion of the joint a year. So chelectomy is a great procedure. Yeah, okay. Is there another, uh, another question? What is the difference between using pair and using osteotomy used in older percutaneous technique? Start again. What is the difference oh, between using pair and... Okay. Uh, so uh, the problem when you... you with the burr, it's a three millimeter scar and uh, an osteotome of three millimeters, it's not working. So it's really, you can cut it very well. With the osteotome, it's not the same. You can't cut, with the burr, you can really draw in the bone. You can cut it perfectly. With the osteotome, you need a hammer. So if you need a hammer, except if you have the sharpest uh, osteotome or scissor, in your uh, tools, as a, in your table, on your table, yeah, but it's not as good as the burn, definitively. Uh, I think uh, for this question, it is better to go, to begin to join with an any cadaver course about percutaneous to know the difference between how to uh, control the pair and also the osteotomy. So it is better to, uh, to, to, to learn to use and how to, uh, to, to cut. So I think uh, it is better uh, bear firstly. I, I, I'm not, now I am using pectin, especially for food. And uh, actually, firstly, of course, I'm scared from something, uh, from uh, the speed and everything. But nowadays, I can control the pair and the speed of the pair, and can also uh, can cut easily and relax more than before. As Joel said, that there is an, a learning curve, and you have to, firstly to using a learning curve, and you, the first option and the better option, it, um, you attend more than cadaver course about percutaneous. To, to know what is the different, difference. It is actually, nowadays, percutaneous technique it, uh, has a good, I think, good results. And many, uh, many colleagues of orthopedic, even uh, for, uh, foot and ankle, even we use using open surgery. But for, for me, for example, um, nowadays, any problems in for foot, I'd like to use an percutaneous which I'm easily, especially in female. The patient is uh, uh, in everything, early rehabilitation, and he can walk and um, happy with the operation without no incision, not like the open surgery. But before you decide, you have to get a good care, care, learning curve to go. You have firstly, you and the second is uh, Cadaver course, more than one cadaver course, to be expert about this thing. Uh, Joel, I have a question, please. Yes. Joel, I have a question. Excuse me. Well, the amount of translation in Chevron, it depends. You have a tips about you, you, you do an first to the distance and then you uh, um, press. In the uh, in metatarsal or not? So yes, uh, how to measure? Yes, yes. I think because it, when you I I press on the first space to see yes. how much is moving. So if I can put my two finger here, I then I measure the size of the head of the metatarsal. If the size of the head is, of the metatarsal is less than this space. I go basal. Oh. So I can test immediately because we are always very surprised how much the bone can, the metatarsal can move. And sometimes I've been 
very surprised that with, even with 100% displacement, I can't cover the sesamoid. Okay. Also, a question here. In Labidus, it is an easy you can do a rotation uh, during you doing a Labidus with percutaneous. Start again, honey. Uh, in Labidus, you, uh, you make a rotation, how to make a rotation in Labidus for metarsal, for the first metarsal. Rotation? Yes. Yes, you, with the Labidus, you have to rotate. But I remember. Yes, I have rotated. Yes. What is the tricks about how to you, you, you get this rotation? Oh, I like to flex the, um, up, up. I like to flex the Alux at 90 degrees. And yes. then I rotate until it's vertical. Oh, okay. Okay, so it is easy to rotate. Uh, okay. It's not easy to rotate. It's easy to rotate. You have first to release the lateral side of the joint. And that can be yes. a very difficult. So you have to, to flex and then you, you remove from the lateral side here. Yes. Oh, lateral side at the level of the TMT. Yes. Okay. Thank you. I have a question uh, for you, uh, Dr. Rell, please. Yes. What about the uh, neurovascular complications with the uh, percutaneous technique? So, uh, with the chevron, start, starting with the chevron, oh, the isham, the isham, there is some necrosis of the head because you are in the head and you may damage. With the chevron, we are completely outside the head. So, you are not damaging the plantar supply and the dorsal supply. That's very interesting. So you can translate 100% and we have no non-union and no necrosis of the head. So the vascular part for the chevron is great. For the basal, there is no risk. Lapidus, there is no, way, no risk. For the DMMO, the same. DMMO, you are extra-articular. So we have uh, the problem I saw on the DMMO, it's more, we had uh, in our group, I think, two necrosis. We had some issue, and, uh, but I saw some patient of some other surgeon, it's because they burned the bone. You can see when they cut it, they cut, and the, bur the bone has been burned completely. So that's a problem of the technique. It's because it's always, as a surgeon, we always want to go faster, faster and faster. With the, the burr, if you go fast, you destroy everything. It just goes slowly, just let the burr cutting the bone and that will be fine. But we have no really vascular complication. I don't have any, even on the midfoot, hind foot, I have nothing. Thank you, sir. Dr. Thank Hani, you. did you see any other questions, Professor Hani? No, thank you, Joel, about uh, a fantastic and elegant presentation. Thank you. And I'm happy to meet you, and I hope to see you again in, in, in Egypt, inshallah. Yes, inshallah. Hopefully. Thank you so much, Dr. Joel, for the time you spent with us. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank Take you. Care. Thank you, sir. Thank you.